the best way to build a go-to-market strategy is to copy someone else. Unless you want to make money or grow consistently. And then it's not such a great idea. Funnel Vision is brought to you by Math Marketing, creators of the Funnel Plan. Math Marketing is the source of the one, two, three of B2B. Today I'm going to give you three go-to-market strategy examples. Each of them very different one from the other, and yet each of them is precisely correct. How can they be different and yet correct? It all depends on one thing which I'll share with you in today's show. I'll also show you a great tool tip a tool that will help you to build your strategy around what the market's ready for. For my first example, let's take a company that wants to enter the desktop computing market. So, firstly come up with something that's truly amazing and different, clever, unique. Take that to as broad a market as you possibly can, and this is what the company I'm about to talk about did. Take it to as broad a market as you possibly can. Find out from that early market experience what group of buyers are likely to be a good market for you to focus on in the future. But start very broadly, selling very widely. Find the pattern and then find the niche that you think might be worth dominating and then completely change the strategy and focus just on that. Let's pick, say, the design market. Now, why design? Well, they're kind of cool, so if you're going to use them as an example for others, it's a good reference point. Secondly, they're a very insular group. They Certainly they move between design companies, but they only move between design companies. They tend not to move out of the industry. They stay within their own group. They talk to each other a lot. So they're self-referencing, very mobile, which is great for contagion, because you're trying to spread a, a virus, if you like. It's great for contagion. Um, so let's pick the design industry, um, dominate that market. And how do we dominate it? Firstly, work out what do they need and make sure that our solution completely meets their needs. Not part of it, but all of it. Fully meet their needs. Once we've dominated that market, then we can move on to another market. Let's say education. Why education? Well again, it's a very good uh, sort of trumpeting. It's a good market uh, to, to create users early on and for them to want to stick with the product later on. So we pick a second niche. Work out what it needs to completely meet its needs, provide that, dominate that market, and then move on to a third market and a fourth and a fifth. And at some point, we've got so many niches that we don't really need niches anymore. Everybody's buying a product like this. By the way, your name's Apple and your product is the Mac, and that's exactly what they did. For my second go to market strategy example, I'm going to pick an established player in an established market. Very different story. And this established player in the established market had done such a good job of riding the enterprise applications market that they were near dominant in that space. Now that's good news, but it's also bad news. The bad news is that pretty much all of the market, the enterprise market, had already bought, either from this company or from one of their competitors. And whilst they enjoyed the lion's share of the market, the market was pretty much drying up. Everybody had bought a product like theirs from either them or from their competitor. But the investors still wanted growth. In fact, they wanted 20% plus annual growth. How do you do that in a mature market? Do you just allow the market to decline gracefully? Don't overinvest and just enjoy the ride down? No, because the investors again were after growth. So what do they do? Because they own so much of the market, if they can slow the decline of the market down, sure it benefits their competitors, but it benefits them even more because they've got the lion's share of the market. So what do they do? They find new uses and new users. One of those new users was sales and marketing, not previously using the enterprise applications. That's a great new user and a new use. And small businesses who've tended not to buy enterprise grade applications by definition. So how can you make your enterprise applications right sized for smaller businesses and take it to them in a way that they're willing to digest it? Doing that, 20% annual growth year on year 
heading towards 20 billion and your name is SAP. For my third go-to-market strategy example, again I'll stick to a mature market, but this time the company's not the gorilla. And in fact, they're probably fourth on a good day, maybe less, maybe fifth or sixth in the market. It's a big market and they've done well, they've profited, and they've used those profits to continue invest, to invest in sales and marketing as well as R&D. The problem is that as the market started to decline, their fortunes declined. They were continuing to invest, but they were investing in order to grow their share in a market that was pretty much consolidating. They were losing money hand over fist. What's the right strategy then? Like the second example for go-to-market strategy example I gave, it's a declining market, it's maxed out, it's declining, but in this case they don't have the market power to slow the decline, to arrest the decline by extending it. So what does that company do? They get bought out and buried in somebody else's technology. They go from being loss-making to profitable in 24 hours. How? By sacking the entire sales and marketing team and stopping the R&D. Certainly maintain the support, but stop the future enhancements of the products. Recognise that this product has reached its peak in a declining market. It's not going to get any better than this. Don't try and get new customers. Serve those you have at the moment profitably, and that's exactly what CA did when they bought Ingress. So we've got three very different strategy, or three very different go-to-market strategy examples. Each of them different one from the other, each of them precisely correct according to what the market needed at that time. So we need a way of forming our go-to-market strategy respectful of what the market needs, not what you, the seller, wants to do. And that's what we'll look at shortly. It all comes down to thinking about your buyer, not your product. What does the buyer need? And it turns out that that changes as the market matures. I'm referring here, of course, to Geoffrey Moore's chasm theory, of which I'm an ardent fan. In the early market, the buyers want to gain strategic advantage, so you should take an incomplete product so that you can co-innovate with them. That's what they want. As the market matures a little bit, the, market, the next part of the market wants proof. Best way to give them proof is if they find others just like them are buying it too. So you want a micro niche. Instead of being broad, you're now selling very narrowly and it had better be a complete solution. Then after you've earned the first and then the second and then the third, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth niche, there's no need to have a niche strategy because there's enough of the market that's bought. What, are the markets, what does the market need at this point? It no longer needs the confidence that this category is worth buying. What they need now is the best product. So you need a cracking product, market price or better, and broad distribution. That's what the market needs. When the market peaks and starts to max out, they basically want to prescribe the rules. They're a third or fourth time buyer at this stage and they know what they want and they want you to comply with their expectations. They want to buy from the well-branded supplier to be a safe bet and they want that well-branded supplier to meet their needs as they perceive them. So now you're into customising around their well-shaped needs. As the market declines, you either need to slow the decline with new uses or get out of the market as gracefully as you can. Long story short, you're shaping your strategy according to what the buyer needs, not what, the, what you, the seller, wants to do. Work out where your market is. Work out what strategy is needed, therefore. Do it. Don't just talk about it. Build and, and execute on a strategy that precisely meets what the market needs at that time. And plan for the next phase in the market so that when the buyers start to indicate that you've kind of run out of one group of buyers and you're ready to move on to the next, then you've got strategy ready to execute for that next group of buyers. I hope that helps. Well, this week's tool tip is funnel plan. We really need a tool to take advantage of what we've just taken a look at, and that is 
recognize where the market's up to and make sure that your strategy is, is dimensioned and shaped according to what the market's ready for. And that's one of the things that Funnel Plan does. And I'll show you that on the other side of the break. If you enjoyed this blog, then likely you will enjoy others. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to receive this blog by visiting mathmarketing.com forward slash blog or by visiting our YouTube channel. If you have a colleague who may be interested, we would be so grateful if you invited them to subscribe. Why don't you do that now? And when you come back, we'll show you how we do that in Funnel Plan. As you know, Funnel Plan is a great way for sales and marketing together to make decisions and then articulate their decisions about the objectives, the strategy, the velocity, and the tactics that they're going to use together to earn the right to serve new customers. Now we're talking today about strategy, and in particular, the strategy that's determined by the maturity of each of the segments we've targeted. Let's zoom in and take a look before we take a look at the software. So in the funnel plan, we've identified an ideal client profile, the ICP, and the ideal client profile describes what's true for every segment that we're serving. And we've identified three segments. Note that there's both a role and a business type, and that we've decided how much effort to give each of those markets. Now, you can't see it on the screen here, but in the funnel plan software that I'll show you in a second, we also ask the question, how mature are each of these buyers in this general category? And you can see that as a result of those answers, we've got 20% of our market is in early market, 80% in bowling alley, and none is in tornado. So by looking at these figures, you can guess that uh, the CEO of a small business is the one who's behaving like an early adopter. Now the so what from this, got to go right down to the tactics section to have, take a look. You can see down here that we've allocated 20% of our budget to what we call environmental marketing. You might call it branding and positioning. 45% to demand generation and 35% to channel readiness or if you like sales enablement. That allocation comes from two important things that we've just taken a look at. One is how mature the market is, and the other one is how much focus we're giving each of those segments. Let me show you that in Funnel Plan. We'll go into Strategy and Target. There's our ideal client profile, and here are each of the three segments. Now for those three segments, we've identified how mature we believe each of the markets is, and here's the split. In the early market, you give no focus to branding, but you give as much focus as you can to channel readiness, leaving a little bit for demand generation. So of our 20%, we've got 5% allocated to demand gen and 15% allocated to channel readiness. Whereas in the bowling alley, the split's a bit more weighted towards demand generation because the pragmatists in the bowling alley need confidence. So you've got to generate that demand. You can't assume it's already there. So we give half of our budget for each of the segments over to demand gen. We had 40% for this segment, half of that's gone to demand gen, and the other half's been evenly split between environmental marketing and channel readiness. The same holds true for the other market because it too is in bowling alley. Therefore, once we choose our tactics, we need to make sure that we're allocating tactics that reflect that we've got only 10, uh, excuse me, 20% of our total budget allocated to environmental marketing. So don't have too many positioning tactics. So I then go into my positioning tactics, probably best actually I do it in the funnel plan itself, I'll show you my point down here, is that as I look at those tactics, I can see that I've got a lot of positioning tactics, which is pretty normal, but maybe in this particular business, given that I've only got 20% that I can allocate to environmental marketing, of which positioning is a part, then I probably should back off on some of those tactics. And that's how you make your tactics deliver on your strategy using those three go-to-market strategy examples that I gave you earlier today. I hope that helps. If you're getting value from these video blogs, then there's a way that you can help me so that I can help you again and I can help others. We need your help with some of the research. Specifically what I'm looking for this week for a future show are some great B2B email examples. So either collect emails that you've received 
or emails that you've sent or are thinking of sending and you want critiqued, or go find some. Go and poke a few marketers and get them to send you their emails. Collect those and send them on to me. Send them to funnelvision at mathmarketing.com. Here's the URL here, funnelvision at mathmarketing.com. Send them there because I'll collect them in a group and that'll give me a chance to analyze the emails together and to categorize them, do whatever else I feel I need to do once I've got a few emails. Please help me out because then I can continue to help you. Thanks very much for your help. Until then, may your funnel be full and always flowing.